and welcome to another booktube video from me Lauren from Lauren and the books I hope you're all very well this very hot Sunday very hot isn't it um today is a another video of my rainbow bookshelf tour um I'm going to the yellow books today that's why I've got a yellow dress on because actually I've got this yellow dress on but I've got, also got this very very comfortable no underwire bra on <laughs> which is really T detracting away from the focus of my beautiful dress so I keep chucking my collar back over my shoulder um but yeah we're gonna be doing yellow books I don't think I've done yellow books before I had a look back but I've got such bad deja vu that we have done it but I had a look back through my videos and I haven't so there's not actually that many yellow books I was surprised at how little yellow books they are they span one mere cube so all of my bookshelves are Put into these sort of like cubes these are from ikea i don't think they sell them anymore they were here in this flat when we got here um and yeah that's the yellow book so i'm gonna get them down and then we can talk through them yeah yeah little little yellow bunnies coming down too so yeah that's it there they all are um not as many as i thought but we'll work through them they're piled as you can see beautifully next to me we'll work through what we've got i quite like doing these videos not only because it helps me pick sort of like books that i want to read quite soon it also helps me maybe get rid of a few books that have been on my shelf for a while that are just there and i don't think i'm going to get to read them anymore um actually though next month oh my god guys it's so hot today next month this is the exact thing i tell david not to do when he's feeling hot i said don't move just sit um next month david is picking my tbr for me so there's no point in me picking anything out here to go on my tbr for next month because david's picking my tbr so yeah let's have a look anyway we'll start with i hate men by pauline harman this was sent to me by the publisher it says here the feminist book they tried to try, they tried to ban in france so this is a um i also got sent a t-shirt and things with this and a flag and these will say i hate men and have like little quotes on the back having relationships with men isn't something we owe them i've decided that my priority is to commit to being a genuine ally to the women i know so yeah, it says here, women, especially feminists and lesbians, have long been accused of hating men. Our instinct is to deny it at all costs. After all, women have been less, have been burnt at the stake for less. But what if mistrusting men, disliking men, and yes, maybe even hating them, is in fact a useful response to sexism? What if such a response offers a way out of oppression, a means of resistance? What if it even offers a path to joy, solidarity, and sisterhood? In this sparkling essay, as mischievous and provocative it is, as it is urgent and serious, Pauline Harmange interrogates modern attitudes to feminism and makes a rallying cry for women to find a greater love for each other and themselves these postcards are actually much more effective than this uh, flappy book but yeah there we go an essay feminist essay entitled i hate men now i've also been sent this i was sent this by the publisher as well fortune favors the dead by stephen spotswood um i really really love the front cover of this but to be honest i think this might be one that i get rid of because i don't think i'll ever get around to reading this i've got new foundation on by the way i've been instagram targeted for a new foundation Maquillage, I think it's called, and they tell you to put it on and let it settle. I feel like it's probably a little bit too dark for my face. What do you think? What do you think? I'm looking at myself in the camera and I'm not recognising myself. So there we go. So this is um, set in New York in 1946, and it follows Lillian Pentecost and Willow Jean Parker. They're the best private detectives in the city, but their latest case feels like an impossible crime. So it's. I don't know if I will get round to reading this. So I'm going to. Um, I'm going to, 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 to gift it away, to gift it away. So that's going, there we go, we've decided. Lovely front cover though. This is a book that every year I tell myself I'm going to read and I never get round to it. I don't know, I don't think I'm put off by the size of it, but every year I'm like, oh, I must get round to reading that. This came out in January last year, every year, two years. But like, I wanted to read this for, I did Pride and Prejudice last year, where I, in June I read Pride and Prejudice and... Um, a lot of retellings and this was one that I wanted to read to, uh, to read this is the other Bennett sister by Janice Hadlow um, and this is um, Pride and Prejudice retold from Mary the middle of the five Bennett sister and also the sort of the plainest one I guess if we were to reduce her down to one sort of word like the plainest sister um, told from her point of view um, and I've heard wonderful things about it. I think I might treat myself to this as like an autumn thing. I don't think I'm put off with it because of the size of it. It's over 500 pages, but yeah, for some reason I never get round to it. So yeah, this year I will get round to it in August. I just definitely will. Um, I've, then I've got a non-fiction book, Queer Intentions by Amelia Abraham, a personal journey through LGBTQ plus 
culture. Um, looking forward to reading this. Um, I love a non-fiction book about um, gender and queerness and things like that. So very much looking forward to reading that as well. Very yellow front cover that one, isn't it? Very yellow indeed. That's going back on the old shelves. Then I've got Helen Lewis's Difficult Women, A History of Feminist, Feminism in Eleven Fights. Um, this was said to be by the publisher as well. Very kindly with a lovely, oh, more little front cover. Um, a, uh, a nice, um, tote bag as well so this is again is um non-fiction <laughs> these books obviously haven't been off my shelf for a while they're very fluffy dusty uh, feminism success is down to complicated contradictory imperfect women who fought each other as well as fighting for equal rights helen lewis argues that too many of these pioneers have been whitewashed or forgotten in our modern search for feel-good inspirational heroines it's time to reclaim the history of feminism as a history of difficult women that sounds very very exciting so yeah i will get round to reading that as well soon um and then i've got <laughs> difficult women promising young women this is by carolina donahue and i bought this to read in the um the irish readathon that happened in it happens every year in march um and i didn't get around to reading it so i imagine i'll probably roll it over and read it next year um in the old uh, irish readathon but it's got some very exciting people who've written on the front that they like this so like i loved it whip smart and so witty if marion keys is saying that then i believe her and brilliant says dolly alderton so this is about jane who's an adrift 20 something by day and a world weary agony aunt by night then at an office party she takes on another role the other woman as Jane's affair with her married and much older boss takes off, she discovers that sex and power go hand in hand and that it's hard to keep your head when you're someone else's dirty little secret. As soon as her friendships, her sanity and her life are put into jeopardy. That sounds very like summer read. Um, but yeah, I think I'll hang on to that to read that for the Irish Readathon next year. Then I've got a proof of Kalolo Hill by Nima Shah. Uh, this came out in February earlier this year and this is set in Uganda in 1972. I remember being very, very, very surprised that this didn't make it to the Women's Prize um, long list um, and therefore didn't make it to the short list. Um, it's, this is set um so a devastating decree is issued all ugandan asians must leave the country in 90 days they must take only what they can carry give up their money and never return for asher and pran married a matter of months it means abandoning the family business that pran has worked so hard to save for his mother jaya it means saying goodbye to the house that's been her home for decades but violence is escalating in kampala and people are disappearing will they make it safely to in britain and will and will they be given refuge if they do all the while a terrible secret about the ex about the expulsion hangs over them threatening to tear the family apart from the green hilltops of kampala to the terrace houses of london nima shah's extraordinarily moving debut explores what it means to leave your home behind what it takes to start again and the length some will go to protect their loved ones sounds fantastic doesn't it it sounds so much about um building a life and what what you can do to what when you're having to do that and what you have to do when you're under pressure and oh god it just sounds yeah it sounds fantastic when you're left with nothing but your secrets how do you start again it says so yeah very very much looking forward to reading that as well another non-fiction quite a lot of yellow non-fiction isn't there betraying big brother the feminist awakening in china verso were kind enough to send me a little package of books earlier this year um with some um with some non-fiction in and some short story collections and they also sent me their um their uh, catalogue and said was there anything I, I fancied in there and I saw this and thought yes please so this is called Betraying Big Brother um, and the, it's the Feminist Awakening in China by Lita Hong Fincher um, and this is um, this is a non-fiction book about uh, the eve of International Women's Day in 2015 the Chinese government arrested five feminist activists and jailed them for 37 days sparking a global campaign to free the feminist five but the five are only the most visible part of a much larger physical uh, feminist movement of civil rights lawyers labor activists performance artists and online warriors prompting an unprecedented awakening among China's urban women it sounds very exciting doesn't it let me just check David did I close the window in the bedroom Yes. Phew. Don't want that cat getting out, do we? Um, then we've got, this might be one that I get rid of actually. This is The Godless Boys by Naomi Wood. And I was sent this by the publisher and I've never, oh, something in my eye. And I've got new mascara and I feel like my new mascara's not doing me many favours either. Um, yeah, this is by Naomi Wood and I don't think I'm ever going to get around to reading it. Imagine an alternative England where the church controls the country and non-believers have been exiled to a remote island actually maybe i will um on the island a fierce group of boys patrols the community searching for signs of faith and punishing any believers when a new girl arrives arriving from the mainland to search for her long lost long lost mother the gang is split one boy falls in love with her another seeks violent revenge the struggle between them change everything oh actually that sounds very good that is not what i thought it was about oh hang on to that uh, another 
non-fiction book. This is a non-fiction book about Mary Shelley. In Search of Mary Shelley, The Girl Who Wrote Frankenstein by Fiona Sampson. Um, and yeah, as you can imagine, this is a book about Frankenstein and Mary Shelley. I imagine it will have quite a bit in there about the old um, Mary Wollstonecraft as well. So yeah, that would probably be quite a good read for Halloweeny month, won't it? Maybe that's when I'll get round to reading it. Next up, another non-fiction. This is uh, Think Like a Breadwinner, How Women Can Earn More and Worry Less by Jennifer Barrett. This is a proof copy of it. Um, and this is published by Bluebird, who publish a fantastic array of non-fiction, including like... Um, uh, cookbooks and um, are they called like self-help books and things like that these days but like lifestyle books very much enjoy Bluebird book as a publisher um, and this is a new kind of manifesto for the working woman a blueprint from dismantling the subconscious beliefs and institutional biases that stop women building your own worth pursuing our full earning potential and achieving the lives we truly want so it says women are the main breadwinner in one in four households in the UK. That seems quite low to me. Um, and yet mostly we're still not brought up to think like breadwinners. The result is that women earn less, owe more and have significantly less money saved for the future than men do. Um, yeah, that sounds very, very, very interesting. Putting that on the pile there. Next up, I'll show you a little, I don't know where I got this from. So on my shelf as well, I have the occasional little item that is the same color as the books that it's on. Um, and this is a little bunny rabbit, a little Easter egg bunny rabbit that's shaped in an Easter egg with these little ears. I don't know where this has come from. Maybe Tiger? Well, there's a... Tstores.co. I imagine that's probably from Tiger. So yeah, he just lives on there. Gathering dust in his ears. <laughs> so he stays there. Um, next up is a book that I'm reading next month. So even though David is picking my um, TBR for next month, I will be reading Playing Bad Heroines. This is another chunker, isn't it? I'm very excited about getting into a really chunky book. Over 600 pages this is. We're, I'm going to be reading this for my Patreon book club. Um, if you're a member of my Patreon book club, um, you'll know that we select the book for the following month, um, a month early, so people get a chance to get a hold of it, people get a chance to get it from the library, etc, etc. And the genre for August is book, big books, so books over 500 pages. The other book that was up for the vote was uh, Daughters of the Night by Laura Shepherds Robinson and Plain Bad Heroines one. So yeah, I would have, I, I mean, both sound exciting, but I'm very, very excited about this. So yeah, we'll be reading this. This is about a school for girls, um, which was a site for a tragic accident that happened um, involving some wasps, I believe. Um, which is why there's a wasp on the front. Um, and soon it's going to be this, uh, the place of a controversial horror movie about this rumored curse. Um, so yeah. Oh no, maybe it's not about. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the early 1900s, Brookhant students Flo and Clara fell madly in love, brought together by their obsession for a scandalous memoir. A few months later, they were found dead in the woods after a horrific wasp attack. The book lined next to their intertwined bodies. Three more grisly deaths followed before the school was forced to close. Now the school's doors are open once more, but as the crew of glamorous young actresses assemble to start filming, past and present begin to blur. And soon it's impossible to tell quite where the curse ends and Hollywood begins. And I also heard that this is sort of like multimedia as well. So there's, oh, here we go. So there's like, um, pages of plays and normal letters to each other and things like that so and some pictures and stuff so very much looking forward to reading that so yeah even though david is picking my um, this is just a beautifully made book as well like it's got really gorgeous book plates in it a map at the front always like a map um yeah so very much looking forward to reading that if you'd like to join us there's plenty of time you can join uh, the patreon book club down below i've uh, linked it it's five dollars a month if you'd like to join us even if you just want to join us for playing bad heroines come along uh, next up is a book that i have read this is convenience store woman by siaka marata um, this is just a short little book about a woman who just finds um comfort in her job working in a convenience store um and she is um constantly sort of berated berated might be strong but like um encouraged by family and friends to maybe get a job um doing something else and she's just very happy in her job and i, I quite enjoyed it um but her second book um earthlings i heard had some like i got sent the proof of that and then a lot of people said that there's a lot of like weird stuff going on in there so I've never got round to reading that but I actually really enjoyed this and I although this is a book that I've read before because as you'll know most of the books that are on my shelves here are unread um if I have sometimes I hang on to books if I've liked them they haven't been my favorites but I think I'll read them again and this is one of those very books so I do think at some point I will get round to reading that again Next up, I've got Daphne du Maurier. This is House on the Strand um, with a black spine with yellow stripy bits either side. And this is about, I think this is about time travel. Um, I really like this front cover with all the little, um, with all the, the jars with different things in. Uh, whoever designed, so these Daphne du Maurier's are published by um, 
Virago. They're the modern Virago modern classics, but all of the front covers are amazing. So this is about uh, Dick Young's friend, Professor Magnus Lane, offers him an escape from his troubles in the form of a new drug. Dick finds himself transported to 14th century Cornwall. There in the manner of Plywood Rith, the domain of Sir Henry Champernown, he witnesses intrigue, adultery and murder. The more time Dick spends consumed in the past, the more he withdraws from the modern world. With each dose of the drug, his body and mind become addicted to this other world and his attempt to change history, bring terror to the present and put his own life in jeopardy. That is unlike anything like that I ever thought Daphne du Maurier would ever write. So if you have read this, let me know how it holds up against other Daphne du Maurier's because you'll know I'm a big fan. Next up is The Tiger's Wife by Tia O'Brien. Um, this won the orange, what was then the orange prize for fiction um, in 2011. That is now the women's prize for fiction. And at some point, I don't know when, but I, I would like to have read or at least attempted to have read um, or g given a go all of the books that have ever won the women's prize. Um, so yeah, I, it's got here an Oxfam sticker on the back that says 199. I don't think that's where I bought it. I've got a feeling I bought it from the charity bookshop um, stand at work which is 50p a paperback so yeah my grandfather never re refers to the tiger's wife by name his arm is around me and my feet are on the handrail as my grandfather might say I once knew a girl who loved tigers so much she almost became one herself because I am little and my love of tigers comes directly from him I believe he's talking about me offering me a fairy tale in which I can imagine myself and will for years and years that sounds unusual I'm not absolutely oh this is a it looks like this is a copy where people have made notes in it. Oh no, they've only made no Oh no, 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 there's a few notes. Maybe somebody studied this, so. Interesting, I can't say I'm absolutely swept away by that um, uh, blurb, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. Uh, Bloody Brilliant Women by Kathy Newman. Uh, Kath yes, Kathy Newman. This is a uh, non-fiction book. This is all the brilliant women you should have learned about in school but didn't. I am sorry if that's uh, knocking door is annoying you. I don't know what David's doing. He's going, oh, Minnie's trying to get out. Are you in and out, David? Oh, what are you doing? The car. He's just putting things in the car. Um, this is to uh, all the brilliant women you should have learned about in school but didn't. So let's see if I recognise any of these names of people because we'll, we'll see if I should have known them. Ada Neil Chu, no. Margaret Bondfield, no. Octavia Hill, no. Elizabeth Garrett Anderson. That rings a bell but I don't know why. Sophia Jex Blake, no. Dorothy Lawrence, no. Edith Cavell, no. Gertrude Bell, no. Lillian Wiles, no. Helen Normanton, no. Eleanor Athborn, no. Ellen Wilkinson, no. So yeah, I'm gonna, we're halfway through and I only one of them rings a bell and I'm just having a look through. No. We def, so this is definitely, ne oh Paris Lees. I know Paris Lees. So there we go. Pioneers, revolutionaries and genius is your history teacher forgot to mention. Sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds very good. Is that gonna stay on there? Nope. <laughs> nope, 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 nope. Put those ones on there. Put those ones on there. And now I've just ruined everything. Right, last two. Alice Oseman's Nick and Charlie. This is a solitaire novella. Alice Oseman, I'm very fond of um, the Heartstopper um, series, uh, which is a series of graphic novels about two boys, Nick and Charlie. They're very, very lovely. They're very, like... They, they remind me very much of my sort of like time, the most recent one I've read, I haven't read the fourth one yet, but the, in the third one they went on a school trip to Paris and it sort of reminded me of every school trip I'd ever been on. She does, she writes young people very, very well and I love the illustrations and this is a novella about Nick and Charlie. So I wonder if it follows the same sort of storyline as um, the Heartstopper graphic novels. But yeah, I'm very into Nick and Charlie. They're very, very sweet and enjoyable. Uh, and then last one, I think this was sent to me. Yes, it was. So Mercedes used to have a book subscription. Do you remember a bookish box subscription called Mothbox? Um, and she and and within that. Um, subscription uh, you would be sent books that are from um, smaller presses this is from tilted access press it's called 100 shadows um and it is uh this was winner of the man booker man booker international it's translated from korean um by uh young juan and yeah i think is it stories introduction the woods a hall and a hall i don't know what it is but i remember being excited Novel. Oh, it's a novel. It's a novel. And you, with this, you can't really work out what is going on with this novel. Oh, here we go. In a slum electronics market in central Seoul, a city better known for its shiny skyscrapers and slick pop videos, an awkward tentative relationship grows between repair shop assistant Yungo and Majai. Having both dropped out of formal education, their circumstances are already uncertain when the market is earmarked for demolition, an event seemingly linked to a strange recent development. The shadows of the slum's inhabitants have started to rise. And a bleak, hard-dead novel tinged with 
offbeat fantasy 100 shadows leaves the reader to make up their own mind as to the nature of this shape-shifting tale huang's spare prose is illuminated by arresting images quirky dialogue of movement moments of great lyricism crafting a deeply affected novel of perfectly calibrated emotional restraint as well as keen social criticism that last bit has pan panicked me because this bit 100 shadows leaves the reader to make up their own mind as to the nature of this shape-shifting tale I'm not a very good reader who has to make up their own mind about things. Here we go. Huang's spare prose is illuminated. Spare prose frightens me as well. So do you know what? I don't think I'll read this and I think I will get rid of that as well. So there we go. My yellow books. Let me know um, if you've got yellow books. Mm. <laughs> let me know. Just like, It's just weird, isn't it, that I've been going through these and a lot of these are non-fiction. Um, yeah, let me know if you've read any of these books. Let me know how you are and I'll see you all again soon for another picture video. Goodbye!